Hi everyone. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we gather today. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Thank you so much for joining us for New Directions in Fashion presented by Glenn Fittick. We've had an incredible week at Australian Fashion Week. I'm Amanda Bartis, the publisher of Pop Sugar Australia, and we have an incredible panel joining us here today. I'm honoured to introduce Le Bon Marche consultant Natalie Constantine, Moda Operandi ready to wear buyer Kelsey Lyle, David Jones, general manager of women's wear, footwear and accessories Bridget Fields, and Laya Garcia Furtado, senior fashion news editor at Vogue Runway. So our session this evening will explore Fashion Week's key trends from all the incredible <coughs> resort collections that we had the privilege of seeing this week. And together we're going to help unpack what the future of the Australian fashion industry looks like. But before we dive in, I thought let's hear from our panellists a very quick recap on the week that was and have them share their highlight of the week as well as a very quick summary um, of what you do in your role. So, Laya, would you kick us off, please? Sure. I'm Laya Garcia Furtado, as um, she mentioned. I work at Book Runway. I'm the senior fashion news editor there, and my job, um, especially here this week, is going to shows, reviewing shows, um, and looking at things. It's my main job, which is nice. Um, my favorite thing that I saw this week was, I'm going to do a different one so that we don't have repeats, because we <laughs> talked about this before. My favorite um, was Amy Lawrence, one of the new gen, um, who showed in the new gen show. I'm obsessed with her. So I'm, I feel like I'm just, I just want to talk about her all the time. So she was my favorite. Amazing. Yeah. Kelsey, can you share? Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Lyle. I'm the senior buyer at um, Moda Operandi, and I cover contemporary apparel. Um, I'll try to keep it less about fashion, because I know we're going to dive into a lot of fashion questions. But I would say one of the highlights of the week was definitely um, just being really involved in the community and learning more about the community um, in Sydney, which was really exciting. Amazing. Natalie, can you share as well? Yes, of course. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I'm Natalie Constanti. I work for Le Bon Marché, the Parisian uh, department store. And um, I work as a consultant for, for the store. I'm based in London. And, uh, and also, uh, I travel, as you can see here, uh, to scout new brands, to find interesting uh, emerging uh, brands and talents and uh, ideas, new concepts, all this kind of thing for the store. Uh, While well, this week has been an amazing week, and I would like to thank um, the Australian Fashion Week for inviting me one more time. I, I was uh, also here last year, and uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, yeah, this, this, week, this week has been really uh, busy with creativity and, um, and interesting uh, brands sh showing um, uh, their, their, their work. In fact, um, I joined you on Amy Lawrence. I had a crush on her. <laughs> she's uh, yeah, she's uh, one of the next gen. Um, I should say as well that Albus Lehmann um, was a really beautiful opener. Um, we picked up the brand last year, and um, it's been very successful so far. And I think the evolution of the brand from this show, last show, um, is, um, is uh, really promising, and uh, we uh, lots of more, col more colors, more fabrics, uh, interesting um, uh, way of um, re reconstructing the garment mm -hmm. and um, repurposed uh, uh, fabrics. So yeah, this is, uh, th this is one also of my favorites. That was my highlight too. <laughs> yeah, um, Bridget, <laughs> can you share as well a bit about what you do and your highlight? Hi everyone, I'm Bridget Veals and I have the fortunate position of heading up all of uh, women's fashion footwear and accessories for David Jones department store. Uh, and I think that this week, the real beauty of Fashion Week here in Sydney has just been that mix between new gen designers and iconic brands like Carla being back on the runway and also the indigenous fashion show, which I think was really great to see that mix of um, culture and fashion and inclusivity brought to life down here at Carriage Works as well as the opportunity to see some iconic landmarks around Sydney with some of the shows at the Opera House, at the Aquarium, etc. So it's been a really great week. Amazing. Well, we might kick off with you. 
would love to know what are some of the key trends that you spotted on the runway? What are we all going to be wearing next? <laughs> Possibly not a lot with some of uh, <laughs> what we saw on the runway. Um, there were definitely, um, I think there's such a confidence in Australian fashion that there was lots and lots of sheer, there was lots of flesh, there was lots of backless. Uh, fortunately, that did come with some layering, so we're, there is a little bit of covering up with that, but I think there was a real confidence to to wear quite daring um, fashion again. And that was just mixed with um, lots of denim, which I think Australians love, still some prints, which never go out of style here, and some really beautiful elevated resort wear. So I think it, it's just a, a great mix throughout the week of both a casual lifestyle wardrobe through mm -hmm. to a super sexy girl going out in the evening. So I think, I think we've seen a lot of different trends and a lot of choice for certainly the consumer. And what about, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> From an accessory perspective. We're supposed to be the nervous ones. Accessory trends. Oh, look, I think <coughs> in terms of accessories, we saw possibly less, but there was certainly oversized bags, flat shoes, sandals, warm hosiery. It was great to see hosiery come back in a really um, fashion forward way. So I think whether you're carrying a um, oversized bag um, and wearing flats, we're all in flats, we noticed today, <laughs> we're saying we're supercharging around I know, Fashion Week. I but missed the memo. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we think... Um, it's great to see heels on, on people and really enjoying dressing up. So I think, um, yeah, accessories do finish the outfit, but I think what Australian fashion really does is ready to wear mm -hmm. really well. Um, and Natalie, so from Le Bon Marché, yeah. have you seen a shift in the way consumers are shopping? Um, I would say that since COVID, yes, um, may, many things have happened. Uh, with COVID, with, with, uh, we developed a lot of uh, off um, events and um, to keep the relationship with the customer. So we developed um, talks, um, workshops online, of course, our e-commerce. And since we reopened, uh, um, the customers were so happy to find that during COVID, but they wanted more of that on top of our edited um, selection of brands and, uh, and products. So we carry on on that. And um, for instance, we, we develop more and more pop-ups, um, very, sp very special. I would, I would take the, the example of Zimmerman at the moment. If you happen to be in Paris uh, before uh, the 11th of August, we have a fantastic pop-up uh, on the second floor, the, lux the luxury floor, where you can really um, enjoy the Australian vibe by the beach. We have a selected wardrobe uh, dedicated to us that you can only find in the store. We have uh, digital screens that project you know, the, the, the lifestyle of um, Australia, yeah. while well, we try to. <laughs> we have giant shells um, where you can hear the ocean. So this Incredible. is something that we like to do, and we, we're going to do that more. Um, we have off schedule when the store is closed. Mm -hmm. So we have um, we started with an um, uh, immersive theater where customers get involved into the, the theater we are, uh, we are doing implementing in the store and we continue with the circus so it's all about um, dancing and acrobats um, on a vertical stage so it's quite uh, unusual to find that in a store but that's what people want to find you know, something more than uh, um, uh, a great shopping in. space yeah. well with great brands well that's what I'm uh, that's why I'm here here today to find great brands and uh, emerging talent but we, we need to, to go a little bit more because uh, that's what they want. And it's true that the shift we've been yeah. noticing, and it's, 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 yeah, it's all started from COVID. And what are some of the great brands that you spotted this week that you think your, your shopper at Le Bon Marché will love? I think there were many. <laughs> um, well, for confidential reason, I won't be allowed to, to okay. tell you fair, uh, fair. <laughs> which one. Um, but um, yeah, I'm confident. Yeah, there, there would be uh, some good um, um, discoveries for the buyers, and um, I can't wait to to, 
to, uh, to debrief with yeah. them. And um, yeah, again, uh, Albus, yeah. really nice. And um, I think um, as you were talking about trends, I think the, the evening wear mm -hmm. was quite strong as well. This, this week was a key uh, feature in, in the shows. Uh, whether it was very glamorous, like uh, Carla Zampati, yeah. or um, more modern, chic, um, understated uh, in Bear Park, or um, uh, so, um, um, well, um, uh, sorry, I have this, man, uh, this on my mind, uh, but so, yeah, there were so many, sorry. Um, so body, body conscious silhouettes as well for night, um, yes, um, Victorian woods as well. Um, you can wear that from day to to, to night. Sure. So um, I think yeah, the the, the evening uh, spirit wa was there. Yeah. And of course, Romans was born was a striking show. Always, uh, yeah. Striking and the beautiful gowns, completely embroidered and and uh, encrusted, were like wow. Amazing. They, they had a wow effect. So yeah, lots of good things. Yeah. <laughs> and Kelsey, um, are you able to share a little bit about, so you, we mentioned earlier that you came to uh, Fashion Week here back in 2017 and you've been a couple of times since then. How do you see street style evolving and did you see any obvious street style trends um, throughout the week? Um, Yes, I don't remember what the street style was like back in 2017, but um, this year I would say it's definitely very inspiring. It's very colorful, very print heavy when you come here and you see the street style. Um, whereas, you know, coming from New York, it's probably the complete opposite, super minimal um, and a, um, a bit more quiet, I would say. Um, so it's really fun to come here and really see everyone embrace like texture, color, prints. Um, we saw a ton of stockings on the street style. As Bridget mentioned, we saw them on the runway. So it's nice to kind of see that um, those two come together. Uh, I would say red stockings in particular. I yeah. saw someone over here with red stockings <laughs> on. Um, and then um, some very charismatic people. I saw someone dressed as a table. Saw that as well. That With was incredible. I think they had glasses yeah. and pastries. I think you she could said that she was of. serving. Yes. Yeah. Ah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for, for you, what were some of the trends that you spotted this week that you think will translate really nicely for the motor operandi shopper? Um, I'll definitely, I'll definitely kind of reiterate what Natalie said. The, I think coming, I went, coming here last year, it was very much. Um, like resort wear vacation takeaway. And this year I felt overall there was a really nice day to night component. Cause mm -hmm. you know, when we look at Australian brands, we look at Australian brands as the expert of people who know like, um, like beach casual wear. ease, yeah. beach wear, and it's, it's super chic and we all want to wear it. But what was really exciting was to see um, all of the day to night in the evening wear and you know, under that evening wear umbrella fell um, the beautiful chiffon. So we saw a lot of sheerness, sheer skirts with a really sophisticated great blazer over it. Um, Carla's and Patty had really beautiful um, brocades and jacquards, which I think are a bit unexpected when coming to Australia Fashion Week, which is really nice. Um, also under that umbrella, I would say was lace. There was a lot of lace on the runways from Anna Kwan um, to Carla Spectic, um, and again, Carla's and Patty. And then um, loved seeing the velvets as well. Another like yeah. evening fabrication that felt very fresh for Australia. Um, Rory had a beautiful, um, little mini velvet dress love that Rory. I fell in love with. <laughs> yeah. um, and then um, I had someone else to top my head, but I just forgot. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there was a lot to talk about within that space. Yeah. Oh, fringe. Ooh. Really fun fringe, to see yeah. fringe. Yes. I, feel it's, I think it's going to be a that bit of a fringe. fringe. Yeah. 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 And Laya, from your perspective, you cover fashion weeks all around the world. What do you think makes Australian fashion and our designers so unique? I think it's, um, I was really surprised to come here and see that there's such a really wide breadth of the kinds of clothes that they're making. I think, like you said, you think of Australia fashion, you think of resort, you think of swimwear, you think of like casual, and we have that here. Like I definitely saw that, but there is also, um, 
you know, you have like your Donna Spiridongogos, who's very like artful and, you know, his clothes are literally art pieces. And then you have, um, you know, I thought the Werner show was super cool. And for me, coming to Australia for the first time, seeing this sort of take on like Australian style with like the board shorts and the t-shirts, mm -hmm. like that felt really special to me because I was like, this is what I imagine Australia fashion to be, but this is like the coolest possible version of that. Um, so I think it's cool that there are a lot of great designers in like sort of different niche, mm -hmm. um, which is not something that is present as much, I, I would say, in other cities. I feel like, you know, London, it's like arty and yeah. like you have these sort of like sort of stereotypical yeah. vibes that you expect from each city. And then Australia really has a little bit of everything, which I think is really cool. Yeah, I agree. Are there any new shapes that you spotted on the runway that you felt really fresh and maybe different, unique, or you haven't seen in a while that are making a return? Honestly, like, not even on the runway. I just, uh, speaking of the street style trends, I feel like the girlies here love a Bermuda short. Um, yes. And everywhere I was like, Bermuda, Bermuda suit, Bermuda short, Bermuda with boots. And then at the Bear Park show, there was that look with, like, Bermuda jeans and, like, a coat and... I was like, ooh, do I want to wear Bermuda shorts now? Like I, so I feel like that's something. It's not like a Bermuda short is not a new shape, but I feel like being here made me see it in a new way, which is always like fun. Love. Um, Bridget, I thought I'd ask you, what are some of the challenges that you think that the future of fashion face and how do you think we can overcome those or what are some opportunities that are presented by those challenges? Wow, that's quite a big question. Yeah, it's like we're going straight in because I've saw we've only got about half an hour to go, 40 minutes. Um, I think the challenges are that fashion moves so quickly now that trends can change. And we saw even this, the speed with which we came out of COVID into people buying a lot of really um, high fashion, evening fashion, high heels, to how quickly we've now moved to a more as they were calling it, quiet luxury now into elevated luxury. So I think what's hard in the industry is, or, or the, the big thing is how to keep up with the pace of how quickly the consumer can change mm -hmm. and their needs change. And I suppose what's good with those challenges is that with the amount of data analytics, AI, which whatever you want to call it, that there is a lot more opportunity for both in the design process through to the buying process and selling it. Um, there's a lot more um, opportunity to get really good data to make mm -hmm. more informed decisions to help designers actually design virtually. Yeah. Um, and all of that just leads hopefully then to a more sustainable fashion yes. industry that if we are um, making, making products for the consumer because we know they're picking it up on social media or they're... Mm -hmm you know, on Instagram and they're liking this and we can predict trends better, then we can um, not only the designers design more in mind of that customer, but then we can, um, certainly from a buying, I don't know how many people do buying, but just knowing what even sizes that mm -hmm. you need to buy and how much you need to buy so that there's less waste. And therefore, you know, obviously from a profitable um, perspective that's better for everybody, but also from a sustainability. Yeah. And Kelsey, you, in your role as a buyer as well, do you use um, platforms and channels like TikTok and Instagram to understand more about what your shopper might be looking for or what trends they want to buy into? And do you use that as a channel to dictate how you look at collections? We definitely, I wouldn't I wouldn't say maybe dictate how we look at collections, but we have definitely noticed that if something goes viral on TikTok mm -hmm. or a lot of girls are wearing it on TikTok, it has an immediate impact on our sales. Um, <laughs> so we've had a certain cases where, you know, a dress may go viral on TikTok and we're like, oh my goodness, we're like reaching out to the brand right away to see, you know, like the customer's really gravitating towards this. Can we get more offered or new colors to really work with them to be able to um, offer something that we know she's really liking. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of Instagram, I mean, even from, you know, I would say like influencers and celebrities posting more from brands, like even orga organically, quite frankly, has a huge um, impact on our sales as well. So she's definitely super in tune. She's a lot 
quicker um, mm -hmm. than she ever has been before, as Bridget mentioned. TikTok trends come and go in a flash, so it is quite hard to keep up with it. Yes. Um, but it also gives us some really great ideas because sometimes we're seeing like an overarching trend that's happening, like coquette, does everyone remember when that was happening on TikTok? And we can say, hey, <clears throat> like everyone's loving this, let's pull something, let's pull together a curation, or um, we host trunk shows on our platform, so let's put something together that really speaks to the customer and story tells this, and she's loving it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, love that. <laughs> and I'm sure that there are a few maybe aspiring buyers in the room or people who might be exploring that as a, as a career. How has a career in, buy, in buying evolved over time? Obviously, something like TikTok is starting to um, maybe change it, like you just mentioned. But are there other um, innovations that you see changing what the role looks like and how has it evolved in your time? I think to the point of like, TikTok and tech just being so important now in terms of sales. It's um, just working. I feel like buying used to be a bit more siloed, and now you should work really closely with like your marketing counterpart if you have that. Or if you don't, just being really in tune to what's moving the needle in terms of um, marketing, whether it's like affiliate marketing or Google mm -hmm. search engines. There's all these different avenues now that you can look at in data um, that also tracks like where's where the customer's shopping, where she's coming from, whereas before it was really just looking at like historical sales data yeah. and what worked and then kind of evolving it from there. And then I'd also say, um, at least for uh, you know Moda in particular, our client has become more buy now, wear now as ever before. Mm -hmm. So whereas customers used to shop in like July and buy all of their, you know, their winter wardrobe in July, she's like, buying a bikini for her vacation yeah. in July. So it's just changing your mindset yeah. a bit if you're shopping like that um, and making sure you have the right product on, yeah. on site for that and timing wise. Tell, so. Natalie, I thought we'll stay on the buying experience for a little while. So something that Le Bon Marche is really famous for is its experiences within the department mm -hmm. store. And personal shopping is an experience that yes. you offer. Yeah. Can you share a little bit more about how that's evolving? I feel like it's we see so many personal shoppers on Instagram now and, and it's offered within your store. Can you share mm -hmm. a bit more about that? Yes, um, so the personal shopping now is really big for us and uh, so big that we and uh, we decided a few years ago to um, to get the most uh, the most beautiful part of the store. Um, be um, a personal shopping area. So the chairman uh, left <laughs> his office and, uh, <laughs> um, and, the and all the board of directors to leave the space to, for our um, VIP. And that's where we, we run so, uh, our uh, personal shopping session, where we have uh, events, events with the press, even with brands, um, any kind of uh, interaction we can have with those special uh, customers, uh, so that can be with the medium coming to to our store and do a session <laughs> with private um, clients. Uh, we also open because we we found there we, there was a demand on beauty uh, in this uh, personal shopping uh, suite. So we develop an um, an institute with. Um, uh, one of a kind um, um, cabin, we say, um, so um, little rooms mm -hmm. uh, for each brand. Like um, so, Dior has its room, um, La Mer, and all, all the brands. And also, there, there is one dedicated to emergent beauty brands for our customers to try on uh, new, new, uh, new brands. Like, for instance, uh, there is uh, this one coming um, into my mind called uh, Mojave Desert Skin Shield, which yeah. is made in the the Mojave, Mojave <laughs> Desert, yeah. and which is very special. And um, talking about uh, social me media, we had uh, Natalia Vodianova trying it and uh, wow. being in, in, yeah, in love with, uh, with it. So yeah, we try to get uh, to, to really um, um, develop yeah. uh, this, ki this, this kind of service, this kind of personalization um, with, with our customer. and. Uh, we're getting, I mean, mm. I think we are better and better at it. And um, so, yeah, these Amazing. are some of the latest uh, improvements we've made. And uh, there are, I mean, th these uh, spaces, uh, mm -hmm. VIP and, and beauty, are 
uh, are full all the time. Amazing. It's and Bridget, such a success. From, from a David Jones perspective, what are some of the innovations that you're exploring and um, ways that you're advancing the department store experience? First of all, I think Natalie's been very humble because having <laughs> gone to the Bon Marche, I do think <laughs> it is leading um, the way with incredible pop-ups and, and services. And I've, I've been to your personal shopping uh, <laughs> suites and uh, it is, it's an incredible experience. And Thank certainly you. at <laughs> David Jones, we, we aim to offer the same to our customers. So um, the personal shoppers and we have the incredible beauty rooms with, with the brands. I think what we've also tried to do is make um, the shopping experience different in terms of rental mm -hmm. and resale. So we have uh, luxury resale available in our Elizabeth Street store and online. And that was really from a sustainability um, perspective that we wanted to be part of that. And we partnered with um, a, a Sydney company who had 20 years of experience in luxury resale. So we wanted that expertise as well. And we also do rental, and we partnered with a company called Glam Corner, who have got the most sustainable practices um, for rental, so that we knew that that experience that Glam Corner could offer aligned with how we would want David Jones customers to receive rental. So uh, also we do a lot of, um, you can do repairs through mm. our resale <coughs> Um, partner as well. So mm. everything was about making it a mm. uh, circularity and making sure that the customer knew that much as we love to sell them new, that we do really believe strongly that you should reuse, be able to recycle yes. and, um, and that, you know, the longevity of products is really important. What is some, just to touch on sustainability, because yeah. it's so important <coughs> when speaking about fashion, what are some of the brands that are really exciting you that are considering sustainable practices or fabrics or in, a, in that space? I'll, I'll be honest with you. I don't think there's a brand now who doesn't put sustainability mm. into their business. And it's a, it's a subject that you can be doing. I think everybody should do something rather than be judged on what they're not doing. So, um, you know, some brands have been certainly leading edge. I think here in Australia, Kit, um, Kit, Kit Willows was certainly one of the first, but brands like Basic have been mm -hmm. incredible at doing this. And I think most businesses now have got some way that they are touching on sustainability. Mm. And, and internationals, we have Reformation, which I think has been one of the leading brands for sustainability as well. We have Pangaea. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's a mix of brands, but the important thing is it shouldn't be a competition between who's more yeah. sustainable than others. It should just be about making sure everybody is doing something to be aware of yeah. sustainability. And it's yeah. becoming more and more important for the consumer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, would you, would Look, you it's not always the cheapest <laughs> choice sometimes to be sustainable, but I think as we see certainly um, here in Australia where we are exposed to um, bushfires, flooding and climatic challenges, then there's certainly um, more awareness of being mindful with how we yep. purchase is really important. Yeah, agree. Lia, I thought I'd throw to you next. How do you decide what's relevant for the Vogue reader when you're, when you're at something like Fashion Week? So my, my job is sort of, I think, uh, you know, as a critic, as a fashion writer, sometimes people uh, uh, think that it's, uh, what do you like personally? Um, and my job is extremely not about what I like, although obviously sometimes it leads into that. So um, especially, I think it w what was really cool about coming here is that I'm coming with a sort of a blank slate. Like I wasn't mm -hmm. super familiar with all of the brands beyond like, you know, I looked them up, I l read their bios, but I wasn't, you know, I, I, so it's sort of cool to come and I like to see the show. Um, like With no, no previews, I like to be surprised by the show and sort of see what the designer is offering. And then, you know, I talk to the designer and then from there I says, so I'm really looking at um, a brand that has a really specific point of view, mm -hmm. um, a brand that has a sort of a very fully realized vision. Um, and that can be anything from, you know, something very arty to something uh, very commercial. Like it doesn't always need to be like the most extravagant thing in the world. And I think yeah. when I speak to the designers especially, it really helps um, shape that because 
I think a big part of my job or how I like to think of my job is sort of telling a story about each of the, you know, about each designer. So I talk to the designers and the designers are like, I was trying to do X, Y, Z with the brand. I was really into this fabric. And then I am like, oh, you did do X, Y, Z. So even if sometimes, like sometimes I've looked at collections in general and I'm like, hmm. Mm -hmm. I was like, OK. And then I talked to them, and I'm like, oh, I get it. Now I see yeah. what you were trying to do, and you achieve, you know, you achieve that. Yeah. So it's really about um, that. And then the way that we also look at it, especially when we start reviewing a brand, is sort of do we think that there is going to be a, a good development in the future? Mm -hmm. So that, that can be also sometimes tricky, where we've not here, because I'm only, only here once a year. Um, but for in New York, for example, we'll like, see a brand and follow a brand for a couple of seasons to see how they're developing, to see you know, how the business is going, to see how they're expanding their point of view. And then we're like, OK, you're ready. Because we sort of look at it. It's sort of like a contract in a way. Like, mm -hmm. I want to give you a good review because I want you to prosper. And I want you to have sort of the, you know, to know yeah. that you have the tools to take your own brand to the next level. So it's kind of like a symbiotic work hand relationship. Hand. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And as a fashion journalist, how do you see the work that you do evolving and how has your role changed over recent years? Well, I think it's interesting because um, obviously everyone is a fashion critic now in a very specific way with mm -hmm. TikTok and Instagram. And I mean, I think we're all fashion critics all the time because fashion is in your life and mm -hmm. you talk about your life. So, um, I, I guess the way that it's changed is it's probably, you know, it used to be the purview of only a few people that would have a voice, and now that's been a little bit more diversified, so, which is always cool. Like, that's how I sort of got into this job to begin with. Like, I actually, you know, I didn't go to school for journalism. I didn't yeah. go to school for writing. I just um, had a blog, which is the TikTok of, you know, 20 years ago, yeah. um, and that's how I started writing and then eventually I kept writing and you know you work your way up but like I also started from this sort of outsider mm -hmm. um, perspective so in that way um, it took a long time for me to get my foot in the door but I feel like the the sort of flattening of the of the voice not flattening the diversifying of the voices is good because if you're you know if you are good and you work hard on it like you can yeah. you know you get to a place where you get to go to Australia for fashion week so like that's pretty cool. <laughs> Do you think new technologies like AI will change kind of what you do, or do you think it will open up new opportunities? I would hope not. I, I mean, you know, uh, I'm a writer, so I don't believe in AI as a thing that should take my job. Agreed. Like, I'm sure people will, like, use AI to write a variety of things, but I think, you know, like... Uh, not to compare myself to like a novelist, but like you, when you're writing, you're writing from your brain. You can't mm -hmm. out, you can't outsource that. So yeah. I feel like um, I hope that that has nothing to do with my life. Yeah, ever. I agree. <laughs> um, I might throw this question to everyone: How, in your industries and in the fashion industry in particular, how do you see new technologies like AI impacting what the future of fashion looks like? I'll go I, I think it's huge. As I said before, it's going to touch absolutely everything we do, mm. the speed with which we can gather data, the amount of data that we can um, analyze. Is never, it's just going to get quicker and quicker. Mm -hmm. And it will be a touch point to everything that, we, everything that we do. So certainly, as I said before, from a buying perspective, you never before could really predict how many garments you were going to make. But now there are tools that will tell you the best outcome by color, by size, by shape, and predict for a buyer how or, or what to buy. Mm -hmm. And buyers just simply haven't had those tools before. And the fact that it is taking data from everything, like you're, we're socially feeding into this by every like that you do, by every hashtag that you do, mm -hmm. is feeding data into this world that all comes back around. So I, I think it's, it's going to completely um, change where we, send, where we send fashion and how fast we send it or when we send fashion. So yeah. I think it touches everything. Yeah, it feels... If you're going to have a conversation about the future of fashion, it has to; those emerging technologies need to come into the conversation. Um, 
I wanted to ask you as well, what do you think about some Australian brands like Zimmerman? How do you think that they've built successful, sustainable businesses? What learnings can be applied? Um, oh look, Zimmerman has just done such an incredible job. I think, though, for all the Australians here, that they've obviously been around a long time, so it's not been a quick rise, but maybe internationally where it feels like they just landed and exploded mm. and have been in, a, an absolutely incredible force. I think that, you know, they, they epitomise what great design partnership between the fact that, um, you know, you've got two sisters and, and many of the Australian brands have got two people in their brands, either brothers or sisters like um, Camilla um, Mark or, you know, couples, etc. And you normally have a creative and a business side. Mm -hmm. And that's been the same with, with the Zimmermans. And they have slowly but surely, surely built this incredible empire and stayed very authentic to their handwriting, to where they come from. And I think should, you know, be truly admired for what they've done. But I also think that they've brought attention to all of Australian fashion mm -hmm. and certainly there's a great deal of pride when I shop your department store or you look online and you see so many Australian brands now featured internationally and that it's really a respected um, industry for us. I agree. And Natalie, while we're, while we're talking about <coughs> Zimmerman, one of our most iconic Australian brands, what are some of the Australian fashion brands that are making waves in Europe? I would say Alame. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, Alame definitely. Uh, I think um, the, um, the, the, the what they have in common with uh, Zimmerman is also the vision. Um, so the vision is really strong, and mm -hmm. Alame is, is, is going uh, through that route. Um, and also, um, um, going back to one of your first questions, what what makes Australia very specific, mm -hmm. uh, Australian fashion, uh, I would say, uh, and talking about Alame, th the prints. I've, uh, yeah. I've noticed that um, many prints in many collections are made, uh, are own made, uh, from the mills here in Australia, yeah. and um, and Alame, the prints is are. I mean, so specific, so beautiful, so colorful, um, so, I mean, uh, so refined. I mean, the ideas between, I know the inspiration, for instance, next year will be Mex Mexico, but it's always, you know, a, 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 um, like a, a journey, a, a trip into the, um, the, um, the making of the mm -hmm. garment, the, the psychology of the, about the collection. So I think that's very specific to uh, Australia, and Zimmerman is a good example, so Alame. Alame, for me, is, a, is, a, is the next one. Wow. Yeah. And Kelsey, from your perspective on Moda, what are some of the Australian brands that are really resonating with your, your shoppers? Mm -hmm. We have a ton of Australian brands on Moda, um, but I would I would say Alame is definitely a brand as well um, in the U.S. that um, has has blown up and become very popular. Um, we also have you know brands like Mato who do really mm -hmm. well for us and have been around for a while and are a bit more minimal and clean and um, really you know, she really goes to her for, you know, a cotton dress or just super easy chic dressing. Um, we launched a brand called Posse about oh, yeah. three or four years ago, exclusively in the US. And that has become um, a really big brand for us as well. It's more of an opening price point that we offer too on Moda. Yeah. Um, I think the Australian um, brands offer a very sharp price point for our customer. So that's another reason why she gravitates towards the brand, because you can get a really great look yeah. um, for an amazing price when you're sitting next to brands like The Row or Kate yeah. um, on the website. And what do you think is driving some of the trends? I know for Posse, for example, like Meghan Markle wore that black and mm -hmm. white striped um, column dress. Is, are the trends driven by celebrity? Are they driven by social? Are they driven by... Um, the work that publications like Vogue do? I think, I think it's a mix of all of those things, to be honest. Um, it could also be, you know, what us as a company are feeling very strongly about um, mm -hmm. and what we believe in, and we want to build a campaign around that. So I think it's kind of all of those things intertwined, to be honest. <laughs> Can you share um, some of the trends that you'll be kind of heroing over the coming months? 
I think. Well, we just launched a huge surf campaign. I don't know if anyone saw that. Um, mm -hmm. So we were super excited about that. And that's when we kind of um, just themed, came up together within a brainstorm and, and decided to launch. And we definitely had a lot of Australian brands within that um, campaign who developed amazing exclusive product for us. Um, but as we head into, um, you know, resort, like the questions we just saw, we don't have we don't have our trends very set, but I will say we always take what we see from Australia Fashion Week because they really kick off mm -hmm. um, Resort 25 and then apply that to when we head into New York market, Paris market, and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, so I think evening obviously is gonna stand out because we've talked about that so much. Um, denim, to, as Bridget mentioned as well, there was a ton of denim on the runway, so it's nice to see, you know, denim showing up on the runways. Gucci just walked out a ton of denim on the runway. So I think that's just something to keep in mind as we head in to market. Um, and then, I mean, shorts I saw last season, they're not going away. So. <laughs> Bermuda shorts, baby. Bermuda shorts. Lyle, what, what are you seeing? What are some of the trends that you've spotted at International Fashion Weeks around the world that you think are yet to arrive in Australia? Give us a bit of some fashion forecasting. Oh my God. <laughs> My brain is so empty uh, <laughs> right now. Let me see what the trend reports are. No, actually, I feel like there is, I see a little bit of boho. I feel like boho is the big, mm -hmm. um, big trend that's gonna come back very like Chloe. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I feel like there's like different ways to do boho. Like when at the Alvis Lumen show, I felt like it was a very, it was boho, but it was a surfer kind of boho okay. where it was soft, but it was still grounded in like people doing real, like going swimming or like doing real things. and. And, and I thought that was cool. One thing that I liked about um, all the shows here is that everyone's wearing like Uggs and sneakers. And I think that's super cool. Like it grounds things in a really um, different way. Um, or no shoes, yeah. Because it's like- <laughs> Very Australian. Yeah, no, very we like them wearing shoes. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. Shoes. I did see an, a, a meme about like Australians being barefoot. And I was like, I'm hmm. not, I've yet to see anybody barefoot. So I feel like it's, it's fine. Anyway. Um, so boho, I feel like it's really going to come back. I, I have this um, invention in my head of this sort of like late 90s, also boho, but it's more like uh, beaded, Indian adjacent. Um, and I feel like I saw a little bit of that in the Romans mm. Was Born show, which I thought was so great because they do all of this like very fantasy things and then you had like a beta tunic with like acid wash jeans or you had like a beta tunic and a beta trouser and that was very real to me so i i think i guess to answer your question boho but i like that there are very many different ways to do boho yeah according to australia mm -hmm. um which is love that yeah <laughs> and i might give this question to everyone are there any styling um moments that you spotted on the runway that felt really new and exciting and fresh like ways to wear things? Are we wearing dresses over pants? Like, yeah. I think at Blanca you saw shorts low-waisted and then the shorts exposed underneath it, so the, mm -hmm. to the waist. And I think Anna Kwan did that with hosiery and PE Nation did it with mm. seam, yes. seamless underneath yes. it, seamless yeah. underwear underneath it. So kind of you're exposed, but you're not exposed. Yeah, um, I think that, that that felt like an, a new trend for us on, on the runway. How, anyone else? Leandra had double pants too, which I thought were super yeah. cool, or like There's linen pants. pants. Yeah. yeah. I like in the Victorine Woods, the leather um, socks Ooh, yeah. with the uh, high heel sandals. And from, I mean, from far away, you can see there are boots, so soft boots, yeah. but then they're very, I mean, they're tone on tone. I think that was quite new yeah. and uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. I thought um, when you actually like broke down the Carla Zampatti show. I, I don't know if everyone noticed the um, organza. It looked like a turtleneck just on the runway, but it was yeah. actually just um, like a choker, an yeah. organza that you could tie in the back. So I thought that was a cool yeah. styling trick that I haven't really seen yeah. before. Yeah, and the hair behind it. Yeah, and then the yeah, hair the behind it. The hair tucked into the cool. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. And uh, low-rise jeans, low-rise pants, very controversial yes. trend. <laughs> like, is it staying? Are we are we wearing this? Are we committing to low rise? We aren't wearing them, <laughs> but I feel like that's. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I feel like some trends are for younger people who did yeah. not wear very low rise pants the same 
the first time around and yes. don't have those regrets. <laughs> and then, you know, we wear it's not, old, not old those new. kinds of pants because I already did that <laughs> yeah, and I that, regret it. Take that off. <laughs> I, think, what about, what the, about I think they're okay because I think it, they kind of work in our relaxed lifestyle yeah, low rise go. pants. So yeah. I, I think they're going to be an easy trend. Yeah. And what about bubble hems? Because I've seen, I saw a bit of bubble hem on street style as well. And I remember wearing that back in 2006 for my year 12 formal. Is this something that we'll be wearing again as well? I think so. Definitely I've seen back. quite a bit on the runway. I'll wear I also hem. think that drop waist trend yeah, has become mm -hmm. so big that that's just a natural, like, little yeah. even Cute. party dress evolution to it. Yeah. Um, also, who just, I'm totally blanking on who we just saw this from, but someone had, like, almost a bubble long length skirt with a top over it, and it, I mean, it was more subdued. It wasn't as, like, party girl. It was very was chic. It way. Carla had a, like, a lace bodysuit with, like, the bubble skirt. I think that's what it was. That was actually. really cool. Yeah, it, yeah. it can be done yeah. in a very elevated way yeah. or a very fun way. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I have no regrets about a bubble skirt. I'll wear it again. <laughs> 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 and what about, I think we've seen kind of that floor sweeping trend, which might feel um, a bit scary for some people to wear. What is, what's an easy way to wear that without feeling overwhelmed by all the fabric? With jeans, obviously. Yeah, Everyone yeah. here wears it with jeans. jeans. Yeah. yeah. Sneakers on. <laughs> and maybe a piece of knitwear as well to yeah. make it a bit more relaxed and, uh, and comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> and denim, we spoke earlier about denim, and it's such a cornerstone of our wardrobes here in Australia. I feel like I'm wearing, everyone wears denim constantly. What are some of the new denim trends that you spotted on the runways? Ooh, I can take this one. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Um, <laughs> definitely recycled. Mm -hmm. I think a lot, of everyone had repurposed denim. I think yeah. it was Werner had, Werner had old the best, Levi's, yeah. which were like, they look almost hand painted. Did anyone see them up close? They're printed, yeah. Yeah, they're, those and are really cool. together, yeah. Rory had vintage Levi's with, um, and then he added that metallic fabric to the back of them. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, each one is one of a kind, actually. So like, if you're purchasing it, you could get a different wash because it's all, it's all repurposed. Um, and then, if, I don't know if anyone saw the Albus denim up close, but it was really cool. It had like nicks and holes in it, yeah. and they were really oversized and baggy. I thought those were really, yeah, those really awesome. Them. Beautiful. And what about colors? What colors will we be, will we be exploring next? I know we saw a bit of pastel, but what else do you think will be, will be all shopping? For me, I think it was, and it's a great color, it's very commercial, but it, the hue of blues, everything from sky blues to aqua blues, mm -hmm. right the way through to navies at Vicken Woods. So I think there was just been a whole spectrum of that color for us that we'll pick up on because you can wear it casually or you can, you can elevate it. So that yeah. was probably the newest color palette that felt strong for us. Yeah. And what about from a street style perspective? What were you seeing everyone wearing in terms of colour? It feels like you spoke mm -hmm. about the red stockings. Was there anything else that you, that you saw coming through? Lots of bold colours and tartans and uh, mix and match of different, uh, different styles. So, yeah, people who are very... Um, they, uh, they had um, a lot of personality wearing all these different uh, colours and, and, and uh, prints. Um, but definitely, yeah, big patterns were quite uh, So do we feel like quiet luxury might be on the way out and we'll be embracing more colour and print and fun? Or is it a mix? It'll be a mix. Mm -hmm. I think it will always be here. Yeah. Yeah. Quiet luxury is just essentially every what you need in your wardrobe, I yes, think. More, the capsule wardrobe. More essentials. Um, but I think people will be... <laughs> like yearning for prints to come back yeah. soon. So I think you'll definitely see more of them over the next couple seasons. Before we go to a Q&A, so for our audience here, have a think about what you might want to ask these amazing panelists. I thought we'll just go um, down the line and I'll ask you to share what excites you about the future of fashion and what trend are you personally really excited to wear next? Bridget, do you want to start? Oh, God, I wish I'd gone last. Um, <laughs> it excites me that it just keeps changing and that you start seeing new talent. Mm -hmm. And just when you think that there's not something new, something new comes along and just it, it, it's bigger than you expected and you just can't get it in fast enough and sell something fast enough. So 
for me, it's, it's just the fact that you're, you're always going to be surprised by um, what's going to come next. Yeah. And then probably, look, I, I'm probably on that kind of elevated fashion still. I'm a bit more tonal. And I, what I think is your personal style, certainly, I think you were touching on it before, doesn't affect what you want for your customers and to see that choice of fashion. So for me, it might still be a bit quieter yeah. um, on the fashion side, fashion or luxury side. But certainly for my customer, I want them to have a lot of choice. And, you know, that's what you get here at Fashion Week. Love it. <laughs> Natalie, and from you. Um, Trend-wise, I think uh, we all spoke about trends and specific trends from this Fashion Week. But I would like to say that um, Australian Fashion Week and Australian Fashion in general is really good at... Uh, this um, contemporary uh, feel, uh, mm -hmm. take on the wardrobe, uh, all that elevated but con but also comfortable looks and staples. So that's something that's very inspiring. Uh, even com I mean, coming from Paris and living in London, I think you uh, you do that very very well. Um, so this is something we we learn from you, and uh, this is um, something I will push. Uh, for the store and for our customers. Uh, I think Paris being uh, more than 10,000 miles away from mm -hmm. Sydney, we still have a lot in, in common. And um, feminine, feminine uh, looks um, and, um, and uh, yeah, refined elegance, uh, understated elegance is something we have in common and you do it very well here. Mm -hmm. So that's really an inspiration for us. Amazing. And what do you think you'll bear? What will you be wearing next? I think, yeah, more, more of this, yeah. uh, definitely more, um, um, because I like to try different styles, but I think this, this, this uh, ele elevated wardrobe, uh, yeah. I need to go more into it personally. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> and Kelsey? Um, I think I, what I'm looking forward to in the future is um, just brand discovery in general. I think it's always exciting to come to, you know, these fashion weeks or fashion weeks around the world and, um, discover all the amazing emerging talent um, and even just like following them as they as they develop and see how they evolve as a brand. Um, our client also loves finding new brands on site, so it's something we really love to story tell and communicate to her. Um, and then trend wise, well now you got me thinking boho, so I feel like a more, like think the brown Alvis, mm -hmm. like sheer mm -hmm. dress that walked, but with yeah. flip. So Beautiful. have some coverage. Elevated yeah. both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Laya? Um, I think what I'm excited about for the future of fashion is seeing how, um, I feel like for most of the young designers, sustainability is a really big thing, not as a talking point, just simply like this is how they see the world. And so the world, the work that they create reflects that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been, um, I've met a lot of young designers who are, you know, you're ex experimenting with like, new fabrics or new ways of selling or new ways of, you know, I feel like the the fashion industry can seem very like, this is what you do. You show this many times a year and this is what you have to do. And I think for young designers to know that they have the ability to tailor that to their needs is, is mm -hmm. really cool and to see how they are sort of following their dreams while conforming to some parts of the industry so that they can live yeah. um, is really interesting. And, and that's what I like. I love to meet people that I do that. And sometimes not even young designers, because I met with Mateo and we spoke about, you know, how they like their schedule or whatever. And it was very like we figure out how to make the industry work for us. And like, that's always cool. Like yeah. whether you're new or you've been at it for 10 years, like the the desire to better yourself and improve and like adapt is like super cool. Yeah. Um, I am really looking forward to wearing skirts over pants. Love. And <laughs> board shorts and board pants like on the Werner runway. That's Love. what I'm. I was like, oh, I need that look in my life. So amazing. That's my trend. Well, thank you for sharing. I'll um, before we wrap up, we will throw to our audience, our lovely audience, and see if there's any questions today. Yes. I think we. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Well, um, thank you for offering these perspectives. It was super interesting. Um, I wanted to touch a bit more on Australian identity and Australian identity in fashion, especially. Um, I'm hearing that historically it's been a 
kind of a reputation of, um, you know, board shorts, of resort. It's kind of that beachy look out there. Now I'm hearing we're kind of breaking away from that. I've heard we've seen a bit of everything. We're seeing, you know, paints, prints. We're seeing um, elevated fashion. We're seeing a whole different array. So I was just curious to understand from your perspective, what's the next frontier? What's the new identity in, of, of Australian fashion globally in the next five years? If you've got a perspective on that. I hope that we're not just known for board shorts now. Um, <laughs> I think it's been a long time since people really perceived um, that real beach culture, but I do think that the Australian fashion is seen with a real level of um, optimism. So when we do do prints and we do colour well, it's because people actually really want the lifestyle that we have here in Australia, and it is blue sky and it is warmth. And so I think that, that we continue to do that well. I think the whole boho trend, it, as you said, it's really it's, it's a great Australian trend because it's got that relaxed, very feminine, very pretty, um, and also a lot of natural fabrics that come with that, silks and cottons. So those trends work really well for us. And I think because of the climate that we have here and the way the, the lifestyle that we have here, we do, we do design into that with ease and almost a, a great that comes from um, living in Australia. So it's a, it, it, we just do it very well. I also, I'll, I just wanted to make a comment um, as someone who lives in another hemisphere. Um, I also think as Australian brands grow, it's also as they do want to build and become more global, it's kind of keeping in mind, um, you know, the other areas of the world because you know, when it's your summer, it's our winter. So mm -hmm. how can we expand um, the collection and, and really cater to her wardrobe, yeah. no matter where she lives in the world? Yeah. Did we have any other questions? Yeah. Um, would you recommend going straight into starting my own brand or studying in a fashion school? Ooh. Um, I would personally say start in fashion school. I think you can't underestimate the education you can now get in fashion schools in not only teaching you design, but commercials and management and business acumen and understanding the industry. And I think the better informed you are before starting your own brand, the more successful you would be. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I feel like there's a lot of um, like designing... Like when you, this is from conversations I've had with a lot of designers, especially in New York where I live. Like when you have your own brand, you're a small business owner. And so the design aspect is obviously like, it's the funnest part, but it to have a successful brand, it's also sort of like a sm the smaller part. So there's like, you know, I was speaking to someone and they were like, we did a show and then people were like, can we do orders? And we didn't know what a line sheet was. Like there's so much that goes into like fulfilling minimums, like talking to a factory, grading mm -hmm. the pattern, like all of these things that are the not glamorous part of being a fashion designer or being a creative, but are like the most important ones. Because if you make a great dress and it doesn't fit properly or like you can't sell it because you can't produce it, you are, it's like smoke and mirrors. So I feel you should go to school or like do an, you know, do an internship, like get real world sort of experience before you go off on your own, because like you can always do that. You know what I mean? Well, it depends where you're based, yeah. I would say. There's <laughs> certainly, I mean, we've got excellent schools in, in all the cities, but RMIT obviously stands out. And here in, in Sydney, the you know, design school. So I think you don't have to leave Australia to get well trained <laughs> in, in it, but um, whether you choose to go, if you're lucky enough to go to a St. Martin's or a Parsons, then amazing. But there's, there's incredible um, fashion schools available here in Australia. Very talented people there. OK, I think we've got time for one more question. Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was really interesting. <laughs> Great wrap up of the week. Um, just interested to your perspective collective perspective on where Australian Fashion Week, I guess, sits on the... I mean, we talk about it opening the resort season. We, we do. I mean, in time-wise, I guess we do. Um, where do you see it fitting on the international 
I guess, fashion week calendar, and particularly for Vogue Runway, because you guys don't cover a lot of off, you know, like there's the main fashion weeks, but you don't, you guys don't cover a lot of the others. I mean, you do Copenhagen, right? Yeah. yeah. We've been, I mean, we've, we've been expanded more um, into global fashion weeks now. We do, um, we cover in Spain, we cover in Shanghai, we do Copenhagen, um, we do Mexico. Um, so we are, we have begun to expand more. I'm losing my microphone, but I think it's fine. Um, I think it's, I don't know, I think it depends, you know, we just, people have to come and the work speaks for itself. Like, I feel like what I've, like, I've seen so many legitimately, like, cool and great brands here, and I feel like if the work, you know, if the designers keep it up, then it's, I think the thing about Australia, realistically, is just that it's very far away. So getting people here is the hardest part. But once you're here, you're rewarded with mm -hmm. like, gr like legitimately super great stuff. That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you um, to our audience for the questions. And thank you to our amazing panelists for spending the last couple of hours of Fashion Week here with us today <laughs> and sharing all of your highlights, your knowledge, your stories, your experience. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.